Just before we start the show, I want to take an opportunity to invite you to join me for the Podfluence Weekly Newsletter, which is available both on LinkedIn and through the official newsletter channel. Now, if you are on LinkedIn and it's easier for you to follow there, then please just click on the link in the show notes, which will take you straight to Podfluence on LinkedIn, where you can subscribe for free and get weekly updates on Podfluence articles as well as episodes. If you would like to subscribe to the full newsletter where you'll get additional materials and, as my little incentive to you, my pre-podcast guest checklist for you to use when you're appearing on podcast shows so that you can be fully prepared every single time, then please click the link to the official newsletter in the show notes. Hope to see you there. Let's get on with the show. Hi, my name is Johnny Ball. Welcome to the show. This is Speaking Influence, the show where we delve into the knowledge, skills, experience, stories, and secrets of some of the world's best influence and persuasion experts. We have in-depth conversations with people who are out in the world applying and often teaching tools of ethical influence and persuasion, or maybe exploring other aspects around it, including sometimes the not-so-ethical side of things, and maybe a few other things besides. Guests range from successful authors and entrepreneurs, secret service members and psychologists, marketing and branding experts, even some professional comedians and world champions in public speaking and storytelling. We've had former cult members, neuroscientists, voice coaches, professional stylists, political speechwriters and public speaking experts. And every show takes our guest knowledge and experience to turn it into actionable information that you can utilize to build a deeper understanding of how the world of influence and persuasion works making you a better wielder of the weapons of ethical influence and persuasion in life and business, and hopefully leaving all of us a little smarter and better off than before, and also better able to defend ourselves against some of those unethical uses of influence and persuasion. One of the most powerful persuasion techniques that has ever existed is storytelling, and it has been around for as long as we have been able to communicate. We have been able to tell stories. We tell ourselves stories. We tell each other stories. We tell stories to win people over, to elicit emotional responses. We watch stories on films and television. We read stories in books. We live and breathe stories in our lives. My guest today is talking about the critical stories for charismatic leaders, and he has some great insights on influential storytelling that really are going to be vital for anyone who is in business and anyone who hopes to be considered a leader in what they do, whether that's a thought leader, a business leader, or any kind of leader. You're going to want to make sure you learn all about the seven essential stories for charismatic leaders. The episode was a lot of fun to make and I learned a lot from it too. I hope you will as well. Please keep in mind that we can't keep growing the show and bringing you all this great content without your support. So if you would like to support the show financially, you can do that for five US dollars a month with our Supercast show link from the show notes. There is also an exclusive membership level that you can join, which will give you some exclusive content and access to be able to know who's coming up on the show when and be able to even ask some of my guests your own questions. There are also sponsorship opportunities available. If you get anything useful and valuable from the show today, please share it out to your network. It really helps us a lot and it keeps the show growing, meaning I can keep bringing you more amazing guests. For now, I'm going to leave you to enjoy my chat with Korean Tharakan. Welcome to Speaking Influence, the show that explores the psychology and application of ethical influence and persuasion in life and business with persuasive presentations and podcasting coach, Johnny Ball. If you have an online business, you need to work on list building. The easiest way to get started for free is ConvertKit. It's recommended by industry pros like Pat Flynn, Chris Ducker, and our very own Johnny Ball. Click the link in the show notes and start building your list today. Curry and Tarakan, welcome to Speaking Influence. It's great to have you on the show. Johnny, thanks for having me on. I'm delighted to be speaking to you because uh, you may have heard in the introduction that the direction of the show has gone much more from a show that was originally on a premise of public speaking and presentation skills because it started as a Toastmasters project. So it was very much about that. 
marrying that up with my own personal interest in influence and persuasion and really now has ended up me taking a much deeper dive into the influence and persuasion side of things and wanting to have a much stronger focus on that. And so guests like yourself, really exactly what I'm looking for, the kinds of conversations that I'm looking to have and our audience will be finding out why in a very short while. But before we get into finding out more about what you do and how you help people and even about your background, I'd like to just start off by asking you what you actually thought you would end up doing in your life when you were 15 years old. I thought I was going to be a lawyer, (laughs) but I had much greater natural skills in sales. And then I got into marketing. And in fact, my teachers in grade six and five saw that natural ability in me, even at that age. So, you know, you get in your mind, I think as a young child, the directions that your parents would like you to go and such, and you know what that means. But ultimately you have to make great use of the natural skills that you are given. Yeah. And uh, this is something that I've always had. I don't know why I have it. You know, this ability to engage rapport, have rapport with people, have some kind of influence with them. But it's something that I have taken that natural ability and then I've educated myself around that. Why do these things work? So when you have those two things, where you have natural skills and then you have coaching and education, then it comes together in a much more powerful way. Absolutely. When I was 15, I either wanted to be a policeman or a preacher. And people who know me really well will know why both of those are absolutely hilarious. But that was the path that I thought I wanted to be on when I was just 15 years old and obviously didn't end up going anywhere near that part. They're very, very far away from it. But it's funny how life turns out. Ultimately, your, your own natural abilities and tendencies do tend to direct you. And your own character and values will also be directing you in way, where you really want to end up. And, and I, as I look back, I can see that. But of course, hindsight is a wonderful gift. You have a great deal of expertise in marketing to, to, to the degree that you have a, a company that is you're helping people with marketing and you speak about these particular subjects. So we already kind of touched on that you started to recognize that you had some skills and abilities early on in life. What has been your professional journey? to bring me to what you do now? Well, it's been a very roundabout journey, hasn't it? It is, you never have a straight line. You know, I I go and talk to the university grad classes out of the business school on a regular basis, and they're always looking for that magic bullet, that magic timeline that they can follow. And there is no such thing. You know, there's a lot of zigzags. If you take a look back at the last 30, 40, 50 years of, of life experience and I, I honestly don't. Well, here's the interesting thing. I am doing exactly what I wanted to do at the age of 22 when I graduated from the university. I wanted to be a uh, marketing consultant. I wanted to be a, uh, somebody that was doing speaking engagements and that had entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurial ventures. You know, I'm doing all of that right now. But the way I got here, there was no discernible uh, plan <laughs> in that and zig, zag, zig, zag. And then he eventually ends up this way. So it was very haphazard. And I think in a lot of ways, people will recognize the haphazard is something that you flow with yeah. rather than you plan. No, so, and you know, the plan, the most of what we can plan is intention. What do we want really out of it? And, you know, no one wants to be a lawyer. They want to be what the law profession gives them in the way of meaning and purpose and that such, right? So that's the intention part of it. And so when you live your life with a real sight on the intentions that you have, that's when it starts to come together. And I didn't figure that out until much later in life. And I I don't think I really understood that until I was in my mid forties. I'm a little older than that right now. I know I don't work it, but intention is a big, big, big deal. And you have to listen to your, those kind of whispers that your intuition gives you in the direction of what you really want out of life. Yeah, that, that's interesting because as I think uh, probably everyone who's watching or listening to this will be thinking of, of applying that to themselves. And I look back and say, yeah, I, I can really see where my intentions, my desire to want to be able to perform and get up in front of people, uh, whether that was music or acting and so for some poor souls, sometimes singing as well. Whether it was those things, I that has in some way directed me towards doing a lot more stuff that is not necessarily performance orientated, but actually getting up and 
speaking and entertaining or educating people as well. And uh, yeah, I, I can see it. And probably anyone who's watching and listening can get some sense of that as well. Now, what you do now, I want to ask you, Rich, actually, about your first experiences of public speaking, because it's not too many people actually think, oh, yeah, I want to be doing public speaking. I didn't really want to be doing that. It was, uh, I, I found it a bit intimidating actually being myself in front of a platform, although I can see tons in my life where I did that, although it was very basic level public speaking. But you said you actually wanted to be doing public speaking. So I'd like to know a bit more about your earliest experiences of public speaking and, and why you actually wanted to do that. I've never had a problem getting in front of an audience. I've never had that problem. In fact, one of my earliest experiences with that I was probably six years old. And at church, they had us memorize some kind of Bible passage. Now, I'm, I'm since long lapsed from the church by that time. I've, what is it, uh, had to memorize this passage. I, I practiced and I practiced and I practiced. And uh, there's three or four kids going through the same kind of thing. And by the time I got up there, I had completely screwed up the, uh, the memorization part of it. Like, I got most of it right, but it wasn't perfect, which is what they were judging for. And at the end of it, you know, what they said to me, this is me at six. They said to me, you know, Kerry, you didn't read the passage properly. You didn't state the passage properly, but you said it so well <laughs> that we're going to give you this little prize. And okay, well, that's interesting. It's the first time I was recognized for the way I was saying something rather than what I said. And of course, we, we know that both are, are very important. But it was one of the first times that I recognized that an individual can have influence by not only what they say, but how they say it. And if I have a skill for that, because I didn't even know what I was doing, I was just trying to say that, say something, right? And if I have a skill for that, well, where can we take this? And of course, you know, public speaking and such, there's also all sorts of misconceptions with the glamour, the money it'll bring. It's not true, <laughs> unless you're at the very high <laughs> profession. But yeah. it's more about the joy that you have when you are in front of an audience and the impact that you will have in front of an audience in perhaps the direction they take their next steps or even perhaps their life. And I've had people come to me years later and say, I saw you speak in my class or I saw you speak on stage. And it was this one thing that they took away from that. And so this ability to be influential, you can only do it through communication. And yeah. that communication, you know, it can be on stage, it can be around a dinner table, it can be all sorts of things, but it, it, it needs to be impactful. And there's two ways to be impactful, right? One is the message and the meaning of that message, but the two is how do you say it? You know, and entertainment is a big part of that. And entertaining doesn't mean that you have to get everybody laughing and things like that. Entertainment is also things like intrigue, curiosity, some kind of, some, any kind of emotive evocation that you are able to bring out people's feelings in the process where they immerse themselves in the story that you're telling. Yeah. It's one of the reasons why, and I am bringing some people onto the show. I'm actually bringing on a few Christian preachers onto the show in the future because I am very interested in the way that they present their messages, the passion that they tend to put into their delivery and the emotive effects that that tends to have with, with church congregations and, and the likes. And I think that's going to be very, very interesting. It's one thing to have you know, the ability to tell a message or to convey something very powerfully and emotionally. But in those situations, you know what their message is. You pretty much know what their intention is. Although, you know, perhaps with some of the, the TV uh, evangelists and stuff, their motives may be a bit more questionable. Yeah. But for most of us who perhaps recognize that we could be more influential how important is it then to have that message? Because I know for me personally, it's been important to have a, a driving why. So I'd like to know how important you think that is and perhaps what your driver has been there. Well, the purpose of what you do is certainly what gives your life meaning. And if you are then in a position to convey that to a, a wider audience, it's very much an evangelical process. For whatever it is that you believe in. And, you know, I have a couple of marketing companies that I'm involved with here in Canada. And uh, it's got to be about more than marketing. Our best merchants, so we, we are, I have a Shopify marketing agency. Our best merchants don't sell gear. 
they don't sell product. They sell purpose and meaning and passion and lifestyle. And it's all these things that the product enables. Otherwise, you just you might as well just be a nameless Amazon reseller. Uh, and when you have something much bigger than the product, where it is about meaning for that customer that buys that product, then you can build real brand resonance with. And the brand resonance, it's a two-way street. It's a partnership. You have the brand and you have the person consuming that brand that, and they both create purpose in each other. Because uh, a brand that can't create that kind of meaning in an individual is not going to be long for the world. So both of those have to orbit each other, which is why a company like Louis Vuitton has been around since, what is it, 1820, something like that? Long, long time. Well, why is that? Well, it's not just about the leather bags. It is about a much wider concept of what luxury means in that context. Yeah. So it's a, a deeper message and a deeper purpose. And how did you get in touch with your own purpose then? A lot of falling on my face. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the deeper purpose. So right now, I, if I take a look at the, the kind of things that I really want to do right now is I want to enable people to discover their purpose in some, and in a large part is in an entrepreneurial activity. So I work with a lot of startup companies to ins install systems and, and structure and methods and strategy for them to enable their business to come alive. But they have to bring themselves to that table. And for Merchant Mastery, which is an education program that we run through our Shopify agency, it's an eight-week program, things like that. We say that there's three pillars that you have to have to get your Shopify site alive. The very first one is product market fit. And that's simply that the product serves a purpose in that customer's life. Well, that's pretty straightforward. Either it's there or it's not. The second thing is product channel fit. And product channel fit is, can it be sold online? Yes or no, right? So you can't send industrial concrete as easily online as you can perhaps in the community that you serve. Okay, but the third one you have to bring to the table and that is merchant market fit. So you as a merchant, this idea of why are you doing what you're doing? Do you understand the industry, the market that you serve, the customer's real deep drivers, their motives, their desires for what they are trying to achieve after they purchase your product, how they consume it? You know, what transformative state will they be taken to? You have to know all of these yourself. That's the merchant market site. So my purpose is to really imbue uh, the best of these entrepreneurs, and not everybody is destined to be an entrepreneur. For sure. Because they don't have merchant a uh, merchant market fit. And they don't. And so how, with those people that do, though, how do we get them to come alive? Because sometimes the only thing that uh, takes you from this point here with no cash, no resources, nobody buying your product to here, the gap, that chasm you're going to jump to is your deep passion. And your de desire to survive and your ability to, to summon resources and people and opportunities that you didn't even know you could do because you have such a deep driving motive within you. I can't give you that. You have to no. give yourself that, but I can coach you through those things. Yeah. I think anyone can find that though. And yes. for some people, it's good. For some people, it's going to be harder than others. And it probably does require coaching. And, and certainly I've worked with people in these sorts of areas and, and, and great to hear that you do that as well. And because it is such an important part. And when you know that, when you have that and you have your driving purpose and your passion, getting through to what you want is really easy. And you, most people have had some kind of experience with that in some part of their lives, even if it's not necessarily their professional lives, like well, challenges come up, you get through them because what you want, you want so badly. You've got that, or Napoleon Hill called it that burning desire. Right? Yeah, we have that there. But when that's not there naturally, I think what a lot of people don't get is that you can do a lot to turn that, to find it and to turn it up and to stoke the fires and get yourself to where you need to be. But most people don't want to take it on or to take responsibility for that, which I think why so Anyone could have it, but not everyone will have it. It's, why I say it's not for everyone, entrepreneurial journeys and getting to big purposes and stuff like that. But for those who do want it, it's there and it's available. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Now, what I said was not everybody's meant to be an entrepreneur, but everybody yeah. is meant to find their purpose. You know, like I, in fact, 
If you've ever found in your life people that are despondent, that have uh, depression, that have that are always flailing, it's yeah. because they have not come alive with their purpose or their purpose has been crushed in some way, right? By overbearing fathers or what, whatever have you. So it's been taken away. And what a tragedy when you can't find that in, within yourself. Yeah. Uh, there's a... Uh, Great quote by a American theologian by the name of Dr. Howard Thurman. And this is one of my favorite quotes. And what he says is, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive. Because what the world needs is more people who have come alive. And isn't that what we, what we want? We want to be surrounded by people that have come alive with their purpose and their vision. And we want to be part of that because we come alive in that process. And that's how you create these kind of groups and settings and organizations, even family, where everybody is not in the state of, you know, morose despondence. But because they've come alive, the entire organization has been re-energized. Now, you said an interesting thing, and that is that Sometimes, you know, with this, I think I'm paraphrasing a little, it's about the flailings and such and not being able to find your purpose and such. Spiritually, you often hear about the dark night of the soul, where, where people, the great saints of the world and, and just people in general, what they are doing is not working. You know, nothing is working. Everything they try is not working. And that is... To me, what I didn't realize in my 20s and but what I do realize in my 50s is that is a very common occurrence for most people. They go through that, that situation where everything's flailing. They get questioning why they are what, where they are today. Uh, are they happy? They're probably not as happy as they thought they'd be at that age. Lots of things come in. And you get into this point where it's the dark night of soul, where you surrender. Where are you surrendered? I mean, and the great spiritual traditions, and perhaps even the minor spir spiritual traditions, <laughs> will uh, talk about this dark night of the soul, where you surrender to the universe. You surrender to that greater purpose and that divine guidance in your life. And I'm not talking about religion here. I'm talking about listening to the deep resonance of your soul and finding your joy in a path that was not socially programmed into you. It's, it's rather something that comes from deep within you that you follow the, the opportunities that naturally open up. And that's what very much happened to me in my, and it took that long. <laughs> it took that long to get there. And I, I will bet that most adults will say that in their 40s, that's when this kind of awakening happens. And I didn't have a great cataclysmic situation happen or anything like that. It was just things weren't working. So you have to do something different. I think there's probably a lot of people who will be relieved to hear that as well, having got to various points of their life and thinking, why aren't I further ahead than this? Why aren't I having the success that I thought I'd get? And maybe getting a few clues from this conversation as to things that could help you get on the track that you need to be on. But also I think it's important to know that it happens when it's going to happen. But your intention is a big part of that as well. You put yourself on the road to that and wanting to do something about your life rather than just accepting circumstances or where you are. That's where you take responsibility and where things can start to change. And sure, it's a journey and it's not always a, a fun or exciting one, but it's yeah. totally worth it. Totally worth it. And yeah, I can relate to a lot of that, even just within the world of my little podcast, been through <laughs> been through a few dark nights of the soul with this. And yet somehow we're still going. Somehow, somehow nearly two years later, we're still broadcasting and the likes. One thing I saw on your website, which really resonated with me, actually, was a quote that you said about when people lose their way, it's generally because they lost their story. And if I'm going to be paraphrasing this terribly now, but if they want to get back on track, when they find their story, they'll get back on track. But you can put me right as to what you actually said. When people lose their way, it's almost always because they have lost their story. When they regain their story, they will regain their way. And the story is going to be a little different than the one you had before. It might be completely different than the one you before. But story is what, how we understand our world. And the stories we tell ourselves are the lens. The stories we tell ourselves by not only who we are identity-wise, but the world at large, our, our place within it, is the lens through which we see everything. They are the belief structures 
that we make sense of the world. And the way we then communicate that sense is through the stories we tell other people, right? So we tell stories to ourselves about all these things, and then we communicate that story. But, and, and including things like the sto- we're telling a story now, not only on the basis of the conversation we're having, but also in the very fact that we're on a podcast together. So the actions that we're taking, like you have a purpose behind this podcast. What is that purpose? Well, you're trying to communicate a story and live a story at the same time, right? This is why, this is why anybody does anything continually is because they have a, they're getting a payoff from it. What is the payoff from the continued actions? And so this idea of meaning and purpose and such, we do it and, and we're related uh, we relate to it through the stories that, that we are telling ourselves and we tell other people. Now, sorry, I missed a, a bit of your question. So the, the, it was about this idea of uh, regaining your story, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you'll regain your weight. I, did I answer it, that? Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it was, uh, I thought it was a great quote, actually. Maybe think, yeah, we all have our we all have our stories, and uh, there's a, a TV show I like called Doctor Who. That if you know, it, sci-fi yeah, sure, sure, I do. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the, my favorite Doctor said a line of like, "We're all just stories in the end," and, and there's so much that is true. And certainly, having read Lisa Kron's books recently, talking about how critical story has been to all of humanity, is one of the things that's kept us alive. It is the thing yeah. that wakes us up, and that. Uh, people do tune into, but we need our own stories for ourselves as well. And uh, you know, I had an amazing guest, someone who I will bring back on the show, who has won the Moth Story Slam in the US multiple times and the Grand Slam several times as well, uh, a guy called Matthew Dix, and just one of the most amazing storytellers I've, I've ever come across. And when you tune into that, when you start hearing him speak or tell a story, Everything else kind of falls away. You're in the story with him. And that's the power of a a great storyteller. You can put yourself in that. You experience the journey and the transformation, that that moment of pivoting or transformation in the story. You're there with them in some way, shape or form. And that's, to me, the greatness of of storytelling. I put out a quote of the week every week uh, as part of my promotion of my book and such. And the quote of the week this week is, the spell is cast when you can see yourself in the stories they tell. And that immersive experience, we live for that. You know, we live for that immersive experience. The other, the other quote is a little more controversial. It's more from a spiritual perspective. And I honestly believe this. At the very beginning of my book, he says, the purpose of the universe is to create story. That is the purpose of the your purpose of the universe is to create story. And if we're going to get spiritual, and if you're an omniscient, omnipotent God, <laughs> and uh, you create this universe, you know, you create it to create because you can be anything. <laughs> so to, to, to limit yourself in all of creation and all of these beings and, you know, and these life forms and all these uh, different manifestations of yourself, the key word is limitation. And through that limitation, because you're omniscient, omnipotent, now you've limited through all of these infinite creations. That's how you create meaning. And through that meaning, you can only express that through story. So the purpose of the universe is to create story. I I think it's a a great belief. And uh, yeah, it's certainly one I'm going to go and think about as well. I I, I really like it. One of the things that I was particularly interested in talking to you about is your book. You have a book called The Seven Essential Stories That Charismatic Leaders Tell. And that was done very much, I saw that, I thought, yeah, that's the kind of guest I want to be talking to on my show. Charisma is a big part of influence and vital to persuasion and storytelling as well, clearly very related. And so before we get into starting to talk about that, I just want to kind of define the terms of how do we define charisma? To me, there's a dictionary definition for it, and the the book uh, will give you the dictionary definition for it. Here's my definition. My definition is charisma is the ability for me to make you come alive. So it's your ability to make your audience, the people that are listening to you, come alive, find purpose, passion, meaning, motive, drive. And, and allow you to become more in that charismatic person's presence so that you take that energy away. So in a large part, it is about energy transfer in all of those categories. 
So can I make you come alive? If I can make you come alive, I might be charismatic. And what I'm trying to say is that everybody has the need and they also have the ability to do that. They, you know, and, and it's a real simple process that I outlined in the book. It's through the stories we tell them. We, what we've been saying is that stories are the only way we understand and communicate our understanding to the world. It's the only way we understand our world. It's the only way we communicate our understanding to the world. And so I'm saying that you understand these seven stories and you're halfway there. The other half is to have a deep passion and commitment, uh, conviction in the topic matter that you're talking about. And when you combine those two things, it is explosive. That's what having the real charismatic influence has. It's not one thing just to be charismatic. Con artists are charismatic. Sure. <laughs> you know, that's what they are, right? But when you marry charisma, charisma with purpose, meaning, passion, drive, conviction, through the stories that we tell, then we can have lasting impact on the people and the organizations. That's, that's very powerful to think about it in, in those sorts of terms. So charisma being really a, a great vital part of leadership. It's not, not always present, but when it is, and when it's really driven by values and, and what's truly important to the person, that's where we tend to see it have the biggest impact. And I think if we look through history, we can probably see that the people who we see as being the world's greatest orators even are the people who've had that, they've had that passion of their message, their convictions, their drive, their purpose of doing all of this, and they combined that with delivery and, uh, and ended up with a, an explosive charisma that the world has remembered long after they've gone. And that's, uh, the, there's, there's great power in that indeed. So you said there's, there's seven essential stories to, to tell for this. Uh, what, what does that relate to? What, what are the kind of different kinds of stories that leaders do tell, and, and I'm guessing that's in order to help people come alive, as you say. Yeah. The, and it, there's not just seven stories. There are seven primary stories. There could be hundreds of stories, uh, you know, and thousands of, ca thousands of categories, millions of stories. It could be lots of different things, right? All hybrids of the seven primary story categories. Where I got this idea from was if I looked at the major religions of the world, why major religions survive? Judaism has been around for about 5,000 years now. Christianity has been around for 21, you know, 2,000 plus years at this point. Islam, 1,300, 1,400 years, something like that. Why do they survive? And these are the three primary religions now. You can add Buddhism and lots of, and Buddhism's not a, a real religion. It's more of a belief system. But why do these spiritual paths, these organizations around it and their stories thrive? And that, I just gave it away. It's because the stories thrive. You know, that's why the stories are so resonant and they're so communicable. They're so easy to remember and, and such. So we want to be able to understand what are those uh, pillars to these religions and great marketing. There's a fellow by the name of Regis McKenna, who was uh, Steve Jobs' first marketing consultant way back when, when Apple was first starting, 1975, 76, 77, somewhere in that range there, right? And what his line was, great marketing takes its cues from great religion. <laughs> That's where it takes its cues from. And because if we take a look at the, what religion needs to do is religion needs to communicate its message and to bring as many people into that tent as possible who will then go on and communicate the religion. And the great religions of today, one of the uh, central parts of it of their, their belief systems is the need to proselytize, go and evangelize the message to as many people as possible. And, you know, this is this, you don't become big religions, you know, by uh, keeping the secret to yourself. Mm. That's not the way it's done. So Christianity is what? 2.1 billion people now. Islam is 1.8 billion people. But if you take a look at something like Judaism, it's only like 14 million people. But it's still one of these, one of the cores where these other two sprang from. They're all Abrahamic. Right. And so we have to take a look at what makes those pillars come alive. And there's seven basic stories that they tell. And uh, let me just quickly go through the seven stories. First one is uh, creation and origin. How did we start? What was the inciting incident? You know, and if we go back to religion, it's all about, you know, God created the world. And in it was the Garden of Eden. On it goes. And you don't even have to be a Christian to probably recognize a lot of those stories in that creation story. 
The second one is all about our identity, values, and beliefs. Who are we as people? What are our core belief systems? What do we uh, prize the most in other adherents, in other people? And how do we come together in that identity and belief systems? Third one is the big idea. What is the central unifying principle that binds everything that we do together? What is that thing? And if you take a look at the Apple again, the Apple is all going to be about design, not only on an aesthetics basis, but also on a function basis. How does it work? And Apple is some of the slickest, most easiest, most intuitive products on the face of the planet. In fact, the whole lawsuits against Samsung was about Samsung's making something that looks pretty much like us. Right. You know? And so what is that central big idea? And the only time they've ever stepped out of line on that is in the creation of iTunes. I have no clue what makes that intuitive, aesthetically pleasing, or anything else. But every other product, iPads, iPods, you know, iPhones, beautiful products, not only in the way they look, but in the way they work. Yeah. Fourth story is all about the enemy we face. So the enemy we face doesn't have to be a, a person uh, or a people or anything like that. The enemy may be a challenge we have to overcome. So the enemy might we we might be that we want to overcome childhood poverty. We want to defeat diabetes. We want to overcome climate change. So we need some kind of a enemy or a challenge to either fight against or fight for. So you know you turn around and you know we want to have the climate crisis can uh, be turned around and we can say that we want to have a climate that is going to be sustainable for generations to come. A story five is all about the mighty winds and every organization, doesn't matter what it is, it can be the Catholic church, it can be Samsung and Apple, doesn't matter. They are in a business environment that is buffeted by the mighty winds. And what I say is that every organization is like a sail ship. And sailing ships need wind to power their boats. Now, if you're an entrepreneur, most entrepreneurs are accidental. They go and build a ship. They build that business model, business model ship, right? And they build that business model, and uh, then they wait for the people to come and buy from them without ascertaining the key need of that ship, which is wind to power the sails. Now, that wind can be either available, going the wrong direction, or not exist at all, which means you have a big problem. <laughs> If you haven't done that, if you haven't ascertained the, the speed, direction, or availability of that wind. And in this case, macro winds, macro trends are things like societal trends, technological trends, environmental, economic, political, and legislative trends. And either you know those trends cold and you know what kind of ship to build to, to take advantage of those prevailing winds or to avoid, or you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Uh, I remember back in 19. 94, here in, in Canada, and we're part of the North American Free Trade uh, Agreement and such, Canada, U.S., and uh, Mexico. 1994, there was an entrepreneur in town here who was uh, doing a booming business, selling, doing CD rentals, compact disc rentals. Now, we're long past compact disc, but you probably yes. remember that, right? I hope in MV and, uh, and such. Well, he took the compact disc, he bought it, then he rented, it, just like a blockbuster video or a video store of any kind, right? And he did a booming business, thick margins, great uh, traffic. And he was doing so well that he opened up a second store in a city uh, 180 miles south of here. And that was open just in time for the passage of NAFTA 1, the North American Free Trade Agreement 1, which overnight outlawed the rental of compact discs. <laughs> no, that didn't happen overnight. That was being negotiated for years. Right. You know, that, 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 you know and, and so completely oblivious to what is now a headwind. And it destroyed his business overnight. And uh, that's just the kind of stuff that happened. But on the same point, you know, the Facebooks of the world and eBay and uh, Orbit and Expedia and all those kind of things could not exist without the internet. The internet was an initiative of DARPA, which was a, a defense initiative out of the U.S. military, connected three universities in 1969. Right? And that was a trend that took 30 years to get to the World Wide Web, which allowed all these multi-hundred billion dollar enterprises to take place. But that is a, a wind that has been gaining energy and gust 
for that 30 years. And who knows where it's going to go from here. We're finally, we're getting into, you know, whole new generations of internet protocols that have super low latency, super high speed. And, you know, which allows us to really take advantage of things like uh, remote robotic, robotic and surgery. You know, I don't want to do that with, you know, the uh, third generation of the internet for people with low speeds. But um, yeah. now it enables all sorts of things. Story six is all about the journey we uh, must undertake. So imagine the first five stories as being in the left side of the equation. And if all those stories are believable, then the equal sign says, this is the journey we must undertake. It makes sense. You know, well, obviously that's true. So when you install these five stories in your people's heads, the, the equal sign is obvious. The equation is complete with this sixth story, the journey we must undertake. And there's, a, there's so many different uh, directions that you can go with that in the sense of mass movements. You can talk about civil rights in the U.S. Uh, you're in Spain. Uh, we can talk about the, what is it, the Civil War back in the 30s and such in Spain, right? With Franco and such. Why did all these things happen? Why do you have one position here and the other position there? It's because the equations are different. The stories that each, organ each side tells. And the final thing is uh, story seven is a meta narrative. And the meta narrative is called Why We Will Win. It's a, it is a single telling of all six stories with the addition of keystone elements. And what a keystone is, is that magic amulet, the magic incantation, that, that keystone that allows everything to be guaranteed a win. This is why we're going to win. Superior people, superior technology. God is with us. And there's literally hundreds of keystones. But the story I love to tell is about the keystone called Death Ground. Death Ground. Mm -hmm. And Death Ground simply says that if we stay here, we're going to die. So we have to keep moving. We have to keep moving. Now, I was uh, looking at a 1955 a Fortune 500 list. And by 30 years later, 85% of that list was not still on the list <laughs> because they had failed to keep up with the trends of the time and, and keep their products and brands relevant as people, as the, as the markets moved. So the story I like to tell, though, is that in 1519, Hernan Cortez fled Cuba with 630 men. And right behind him was the governor of Cuba, Diego Velasquez, who was his brother-in-law. He was married to Diego's uh, sister. <laughs> but uh, young Hernan, who was 31 years old, something like that, wanted the glory of capturing Mexico for himself. And Diego also wanted that. So overnight, he, he got these ships going. He picked up some more men. 630 of them uh, landed in Cuba. And here's the problem. Behind him is Diego, the governor of Cuba, and certainty, the certainty of mutiny charges which may involve a rope. But in front of him, there are 5 million Aztecs, over 200,000 200, square kilometers of territory. And so now he's on the shores of Veracruz and he turns to his men and he scuttled a couple of his ships and he sent one of them back uh, to carry word that they're on in Mexican, Mexican territory now. And he says to his men, we have no choice but to move forward. Okay? because Death is behind us. Death may be in front of us. But unless we try to do this, we know that sitting here, we will be consumed. Two years later, Cortez and his allied Indian forces, a lot of the Indians didn't like the Indian uh, tribes in that area, didn't like uh, the Aztecs either. But two years later, just two years, Cortez and his allied forces defeated conquered the Aztec empire. And that is the power of a simple story like that. 630 men, a few thousand other Indian people defeating an entire nation that had stood for, I think they had stood for like three, 400 years in that point, a massive, beautiful civilization. And I'm not going to talk about the, the morality of doing this, right? Of conquering and, and imperialism and all that kind of stuff. But it does show you the power of story. It certainly does. And it's a familiar trope to all of us from film, perhaps more than 
uh, life in ma- in many aspects where we always know there's that rallying part of the film where the lead or someone important is giving that speech to motivate everyone into battle or to head up the challenge that they're facing and things like that. So I kind of feeling like it's very much a hero's journey for leaders in leadership to be able to light people up with that, take them on that journey with you. And of course, have the supporting you and wanting to be a part of the story as well. Yeah. We're all heroes of our own hero's journey. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 not, it's, isn't that right? Yeah. We're all the heroes in our story. Yeah. yeah and, and, and the reason that hero's journey, and if anybody, all they have to do is, uh, is tap into Google hero's journey, and you'll see that monomyth, the diagram come up very quickly. That is a very common framework for the great leader stories of history. And you see all these trials, tribulations, and victories, and then, and it's never a, a single thing. You're not in permanent victory mode. Your victory, whatever, whatever wins you have are under threat by other forces and the things that you have to leap over and slide under and all these kind of things, which is why I say at the beginning of the book, the purpose of the universe is to create story. Yeah, there was a point uh, last year, I think, where I got, I, I was deep in storytelling that I was just buying book after book about storytelling and, and it's become such a, a powerful area for people to be working in and, and talking about. I have several friends who have podcasts about storytelling. I have uh, a number of people who've been on the show talking about storytelling as well. We know that it's a critical part of life and it's essential to do that. And I think one of the things now that you bring to the table for us is storytelling, applying directly to leadership and being able to set you up uh, or help you bring out really, help you develop your charisma and your ability to lead by telling powerful stories in, in those, of course, in the situations where they are appropriate and where they're going to do that. Well, what, one of the things I can tell you, Johnny, is that these stories, the reasons they're so powerful is that they answer primal questions in your people's heads. And in the absence of a story that you provide to them, they will make up their own story to fit that vacuum. And that may not be the story that you want them to tell. So you have to be the business of providing those stories. And otherwise you may be the victim of a whole bunch of misinformation that, that people will provide to themselves. And you can see the dangers of that in the U S right now with this whole QAnon phenomena and such, right? Well, where are these stories coming from? They are so unbelievable, but in the absence of somebody else providing a, an alternative, even before QAnon got its traction, right? The reason stories get picked up is because there's a vacuum. Yeah. Okay. The vacuum is either partially filled or not filled at all. And then boom, QAnon's in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, was, I was thinking a uh, similar thing earlier when we were speaking about why, uh, why perhaps atheism that isn't become a, a stronger uh, part of, uh, of culture than, than it is. And perhaps it is just because they don't really have <laughs> they, they they believe stories. It. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they believe in it. <laughs> there's no shared stories. There's, I mean, sure, there's stories of people you know, becoming atheist or deciding that, but yeah, there, there's no shared stories. There's nothing to, to get behind. Exactly. And of course, that's what you're competing against. So that's very, very important. I think that's something there's, there's a great quote I think it's from Dave Barry, the cartoonist, is that I considered atheism, but there weren't enough holidays. <laughs> I like that. I like that a lot. So your for the for the audience, your book is called The Seven Essential Stories That Leaders Tell. The Seven Essential Stories Charismatic Leaders. Charismatic leaders tell. I think that's an yeah. important word. Yeah. It's where, on right now. It's on Amazon. So people can come find out what about that. They can, they can order the book. Yeah. Where can they find out more about you? Sure. If you come to my uh, website, strategypeak.com, uh, you can come and check me out there. On the right side, you'll be able to download a couple of uh, chapters of the book and such. But, and if you're into marketing at all or want to learn about marketing, that's a great site for you to go to to do that. Uh, but I'll tell you what, Johnny, for the first uh, five of your listeners that contact me after the show, and then they have to say they heard me on your show, I'm yeah. going to send them a free Kindle copy of the book. So just Fantastic. next to me yet. Email me at curian at strategypeak.com and I'll send you some, I'll send you some assets for your show notes. And uh, yeah, I'd love to send a couple of these copies out. 
That, well, that's fantastic. And that, that's very generous offer. One that will make sure gets well publicized to the okay. listeners of the show. And, and I certainly hope that if you listen to this, I hope you take up that offer because this is some good stuff to get yourself. But find out more about it. Turn up your charisma. Get your leadership turned up to the highest level that you can manage. One thing I always like to ask, we, we talked a bit about your book, but I always like to ask people for other book recommendations or resource recommendations, which may or may not be directly related to what we've been talking about, but perhaps just something that we, we, we all talk about the books that we like. We all tell the stories about the things that we love. What has perhaps been a book that has made an impact on you that you would always recommend to people? Well, this story, the, you would like your podcast to be all about influence. Right. This is a central sure. theme that you like, right? And I remember picking up a book probably, I don't know how many years ago it was now, almost 30 years ago now. A brilliant book. I've taught courses around it and, and such because it is so simple and so powerful on the topic of influence. And the book is called Influence, <laughs> The Power to Change Anything. I believe that's what it's called, Influence, by Robert Cialdini. Robert that- C- right? You're familiar yeah. with those, right? I, yeah, I, I am very familiar with the book and I, I may have talked about it recently that there is a new and expanded version of Influence. Yeah. And so I think generally the title now is Influence the Psychology of Persuasion. That's correct. Uh, I just, and look- uh, and Dr. Dr. Cialdini has been doing the rounds on various various podcasts and stuff. Unfortunately, not mine, but hopefully one day. And yeah, it's the book is actually the new and expanded version is totally worth reading. But even if you get hold of the one of the older copies of it, yeah, it's absolutely worth checking out. Though I, myself, I've taught workshops and classes and still do around the stuff of influence and persuasion that I learned from that book. Yeah. Now, what fascinates me is how. Um automatic and many of our responses are and then that's a that's a central part of his book you know this and what he calls a whiz whir click i think that's yeah. what he does the it's an automatic gear mechanism that puts you in this direction or that direction and it absolutely fascinated me fascinated me i i could not put that book down i was probably in my early 30s when i wrote that read that and it's the first time that I saw all of this in one place. Similar to myself, it's one of the first books I've read on influence and persuasion and, and it really fired, fired something up in me. One, one of my favorite takeaways from rereading it just last week actually was about him saying, I don't remember this being in the original, but maybe it was about him saying that not to say no problem or it's no big deal. It's like when you do something to someone and say, oh, thanks, sir. no big deal. Oh, no problem. Because it kills the reciprocity. Right. right, right. So instead you should say, well, you would do the same for me, right? Right. I mean, yeah, I love that. Yeah, I'm always going to say that now, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, it's a fascinating, fascinating read, right? And it's influenced um, much of what I do in marketing. And we employ the principles on a regular basis. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to be looking forward to checking out more of your principles about leadership and charisma. I'm always very excited to read more about these particular topics. And I've really been enjoying this conversation today. If there's one thing, just one thing that you hope people take away from our conversation today and remember and perhaps put into action in their lives, what would it be? That you and everybody that you meet can only make sense of the world, of their world by the stories they tell themselves and other people. That's it. So you can never simply judge someone's actions. You have to, ju- you have to get to the stories that they tell themselves about the situation because that will reveal their belief system. And that is how you make sense of their actions. The actions by themselves, by themselves tell you nothing. You have to get to the deep motives, desires, belief systems behind it. And the way you can expose that is by having them tell you the stories about what the meaning of that situation is all about. Fantastic. Well, Korean Theragun, thank you so much for coming and joining me on Speaking Influence. It's been a real pleasure chatting with you today. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed the show and got some value from it. If there's one thing that you can put into action from the show today, I hope that you will do that and let us know. Make sure you email Kurian if you are interested in getting more information from him and a free copy of his ebook. You'll find his email address and contact information and other links in the show notes for this show. 
Please join us for more conversations about the world of influence and persuasion and how we can all show up being more influential and persuasive in our own lives, professionally and personally, and having a more positive and powerful impact on our world. I look forward to connecting with you again very soon. Have an amazing week. Go and make great things happen.